Okay, so we're looking at uh, C.S. Lewis's Till We Have Faces uh, this morning and for next class as well. And with it, uh, Lewis's most mature work of fiction, in my opinion, and his best work of fiction, also in my opinion, but also in Lewis's own opinion. Uh, it is, as it says in the preface introduction, it, it is called A Myth Retold. And the retelling is of the story of Cupid and Psyche, which he gets from a chapter of Apuleius's Golden Ass. I meant to bring that with me as well, but uh, forgot it at home. Maybe I'll bring it next time. This is a story that Lewis uh, cites in The Discarded Image as a work, uh, one of the sort of primary sources for the, the medieval imagination. Uh, like a repository of myth and legend and ideas that are a uh, useful background for framing the general worldview of the medieval Renaissance period. And it is one that he thinks and has thought about a great deal in large part because he finds it an irrational myth. It doesn't make sense to him and it bothers him as a consequence. And unlike most people, uh, he doesn't just dismiss it because of that. It sticks with him. Uh, it's a problem that doesn't go away. But it's the actions of the characters that he finds illogical. And so when he retells it, which he does in this book, uh, he has a very complex character at the center of it. Uh, whose actions are illogical because they're hidden from herself, in fact. And so Lewis is exploring the challenge and complexity of human character. And this is why this is such a rich story, is because it is, uh, I think he really does it well. He captures the complexity of motivations and speech and actions in a way that I think um, makes it highly plausible. It's probably not uh, accidental that it was his last novel, his most mature, and that he wrote it along with his wife, Joy Davidman. I think that having married, he had an insight into another person in a way that he didn't when he was just on his own. And uh, had a good critic and somebody who was strong enough, it, it appears, uh, to have pushed back and questioned his understanding of things. Uh, in terms of the structure of the story, the first part, and when I say the first part, it's probably four-fifths of the whole story, is the uh, it's written from the perspective of Psyche's older sister, Orwell. And it's, it's an accusation, it's a straight out accusation against the gods. Um, and, uh, and then on the only latter, does the narrator, Orwell, undergo a change of mindset. Lewis will call it a conversion and understand something about, not just the gods, but about herself. And so there's a complexity of, and a, a self-awareness that arises in conjunction with her, yes, her blaming of the gods, but also her own understanding of her own motivations, and also her understanding what love truly is. Because remember, Cupid and Psyche uh, are both connected with Venus, or Aphrodite, or Astarte, the Babylonian goddess, or Ishtar. There is a, and uh, for that matter, uh, we'll get into the uh, Canaanite gods as well. I'm gonna talk about the um, Ashtoreth and Baal. I think Lewis is, uh, implicating himself in exploring ancient mythology 
because it's very interesting, he notes this in the discarded image, how, uh, my, I think it's in the discarded image, but it could have been the four loves, could be both, that it's not without reason that Venus is worshiped in seemingly every culture. The goddess of love. And yet there's a complexity about it that is belied by the Greek myth of it because the Greek myth of it is filtered through to some degree Greek culture which is we associate with rationality we don't just associate it with it it is intensely rational we connect it with Greek philosophy and Greek uh, storytelling remember that um, uh, Aphrodite is the goddess of ideal feminine beauty and sex appeal, as well as love. And she's right there in Homer's Iliad already. And uh, she's the one that, to some degree, starts the whole Trojan War. Remember, there's a, the, the story of the golden apple is told, I think, in Iliad 23. There are three goddesses that are there, a young man finds a golden apple and the three god goddesses get involved in a debate with him over which one of them is the most beautiful. And they offer him incentives to choose them. And they offer the inducements that will come up. So Juno, I guess not Juno, but Hera, offers uh, power. Uh, the goddess of wisdom. Athena, right? Athena offers him wisdom if, she, if he chooses her. And Aphrodite offers him ideal feminine beauty if he chooses her. And he chooses her. Paris chooses her. And that's Helen of Troy, the ideal feminine beauty. And that's what launches the whole Trojan War the backdrop for the Iliad and the Odyssey, but it's also the backdrop, interestingly, for Virgil's Aeneid. Because the same goddess that the Romans worshipped was the goddess that the uh, Trojans worshipped and is involved in a lot of conflict, needless to say, around the Mediterranean. But she goes back further than the Greeks and the Romans to the ancient Near East, and we will find that she is uh, connected, as I say, with Astarte and uh, Ash the uh, Ashra poles, Ashtoreth, etc. And uh, I think that's part of the complexity of this story, is that we have a conflict between the Greek view of life, which is clear, simple, straightforward, our understandings are rational, and something that is hidden from us because we hide it from ourselves, namely our own motivations for actions. And it's the very thing that allows us to perceive injustices very clearly in others, but not to perceive our own uh, injustice towards them. It's the very thing that Jesus talks about when he says that we have a log in our own eyes and we see a speck in our neighbors. We think that we have a speck and they have a log and it's the other way around. So the problem uh, to some degree of the corruption of human nature that leads to a distortion and a rationalizing of what is actually not a rational process from within us. So all of that I think is in play here and Lewis, uh, I'll say more about this when we come to look at the four loves, will deal with it there in a more um, academic fashion and parse out different types of love and their relations to one another and the distortions of love. So it's not just that there are four types of love that he can identify, they also can, each one of them become disordered. And when they're disordered, they lead to idolatry of various sorts. And idolatry of, remember God is love. In, in the Bible, we read that Jesus is the love of God. It's the love of the world. I think it's 14, uh, John 14, 6. And 
His love, however, what I also said last time, is not like our love. It's a different type of love. It's a pure love. It's a love unadulterated by self-absorption and the perversion that is true of human loves. It's a, a love that comes down from God. It's the agape love. And we think that our loves are pure like that love and they're not. And what this story does is reveal how complex that is and how and the complexity is such that we think that we are straightforward in our intentions and motives, and yet our motives and intentions are not only hidden from us, but are often contrary to what we think they are. So we'll claim that we're misunderstood when really we're probably rightly understood and we misunderstand ourselves. This is a problem for Lewis's entire life is dealing with this issue. And it, it's interesting that it comes out finally and I think most maturely in the form of a story. As I say, well, the, the theme of love comes up over and over and over in Lewis's works. It's, it's the most compelling, dominant, it's the dominant theme of his literary criticism and, his, and of his apologetics, I think, uh, and of his stories. And I, I, I think that the, uh, in um, The Magician's Nephew, the um, lead figure there, what's her name again? I've forgotten the name of the goddess. What's, what's the name of the... Yeah, the lady. Sorry? Jadis, Jadis. Jadis is Astarte, in my view. She's a form of love that's possessive and domineering. She's an idol in herself. She's like Galadriel could be. She could be a beautiful queen and all would love her in despair and so forth. That's Astarte and she's a self-absorbed, she is the goddess of love and yet she, she wants only power. It's a distortion perversion of love in the same way that Venus only wants her own self-interest and uses other people's loves to get it. Extraordinarily powerful. So I think that's there already in Lewis's uh, in, in Narnia, but it's much more mature here <clears throat> and much more helpful. And so it's presented in the form of a story. Now remember, think about Lewis's own conversion. It began with this conversation on a long night's walk, on Addison's walk with Tolkien and Dyson, uh, in which the true nature of myth and how the gospel fit into the world of mythological stories became suddenly clear to him. So it was in the context of a story that he understood for the first time the gospel. It wasn't just a conversation, it was in a conversation about myth. And so it wasn't that they argued him into the kingdom, it's more that he learned how to read stories rightly. And I think that ability to read rightly by starting from the right point is what is at issue until we have faces. Where we have a character who to some degree like Lewis doesn't understand the will of the gods and has a complaint about them and it's not until she until she learns how to read her own intentions and get into the story the right way that suddenly she is able to see clearly. And that's the conversion that takes place. So as I say, um, this is based on Apuleius's golden ass and as a consequence, the novel is set in a pagan world. It's some obscure land on the edges of, on the very edges of the influence of Greek culture. And the central god is called Ungit. And Ungit is a very disturbing version of Aphrodite. If you're wanting to figure out, you know, how does Aphrodite relate to Ungit? Ungit is Aphrodite, but it's, there's, there's no beauty in it. There's not this, the birth of Venus, the ideal woman beauty that comes from the east and comes to the west. By the way, Venus is worshipped in Cyprus primarily. So uh, Greek culture to some degree moving towards 
uh, the Mediterranean towards the Persians. This is the beautiful myth captured in, in uh, painting that we know about from Botticelli. Uh, this version, version of Venus is very disturbing, it involves blood and darkness and uh, chaos to some degree and sacrifice. It's a dark god of the blood. And the theme uh, is, is sexuality as compulsion. There's nothing beautiful about this. Not the sort of thing that are, are uh, given peans of praise in romantic poetry of adoration and free will and consent and all that. It's, it's compulsive and it's a force and it's a power that brings uh, life itself forth in blood and in pain. And that's part of the human uh, condition as well, uh, as we're told back in Genesis 3. The woman will give birth, but she will do so in, in labor, in pain. And as we know, there's blood that goes with that. And there's another God, that, and this is the God of the Grey Mountain overlooking this city of Gloam. And the sacred stories say that that God is Ungit's son. That's the stories that are told, the myths that are told by the, the residents of Gloam. And Orwell, who's the main protagonist, is first the princess of Gloam and eventually becomes the queen of Gloam. And she harbors a complaint against the gods and it takes four fifths of the book for her to get the complaint out. And she articulates what she thinks is her complaint, which as we find out from the final fifth is not actually her real complaint, but she thought it was because she deceived herself. She wants to be heard, and she wants to be heard before somebody who's authoritative. And what she ultimately wants, she wants judgment because she thinks she has behaved rightly and the gods have mistreated her. She's been rendered an unjust judgment. And how many people, like this is the, this is the reason that this book is so powerful and persuasive is because many people harbor bitterness and they feel that they've been done, dealt with unjustly. That's why they're angry. That's why their lives are disordered or whatever. They want clarity and justice and they believe that they themselves will be acquitted when that judgment comes. And that's the position here. And it's the position of pretty much every sinner I've ever met before they know what God is like and what they're like, namely that they're sinners. But Oral does not see that she's a sinner or when she admits that she's done certain things wrong, she tends to regard them as mistakes and small in size compared to the injustices done against her. And so she desires judgment and she desires, desires clarity. And this becomes a theme very much uh, that preoccupies Lewis as well. And if you read his um, reflections on the Psalms, the very first chapter looks at how Psalms are often uh, written from the perspective of somebody who is desiring above all a judgment, as in justice. Give sentence with me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the innocency that is in me. Psalm 7 verse 8 belief on the psalmist part that they're innocent and yet they're experiencing suffering and injustice and they are believing that God being just will ultimately vindicate them but at this point they're experiencing nothing of the sort so it's the regular situation of suffering uh, that speaks so powerfully out of the psalms to pretty much everyone who reads them and Orwell is uttering exactly this plea so that's where the story, the first four-fifths of it, really is uh, committed to this desire for judgment. Um, and then comes the turn. I'm not gonna deal with the turn today. I'm deal with, I'll deal with the final fifth and the, the conversion account and how she sees things radically different 
in the second class on this. Um, and I wanna jump ahead to that, but I'm, I'm just saying that that's how it begins. It begins with a desire for judgment and the judgment is in relation to love, which she thinks is the, her misunderstood love and um, the mistreatment of the gods. So, um, and when she tells this, she is a bitter old woman. By the way, interest, inter interestingly, uh, Lewis dedicates this work to Joy Davidman. Love is too young to know what conscience is, is the quotation he puts here at the outset. To her, part one. We begin with an old woman looking back on her life and if she's going to uh, recount how she got to the place where she is. So there's an element of um, retrospective consideration of the case she has. Because she, that's what she's doing is she's effectively, in demanding for judgment, she's acting like a lawyer standing before a judge and pleading her case. And she's doing it from, from the vantage point of being a queen. Now we're gonna find that she's not always a queen when she tells the story, we're gonna find she's a young woman growing up with a, with a sister and will tell how she got to the point where she is. And she is very bitter right at the outset of this. And in fact, she says, I'm old now and have not much to fear from the anger of the gods. I have no husband, uh, nor child, nor hardly a friend. The, through whom they can hurt me. My body, this lean carrion that still has to be washed and fed and of clothes hung about it daily with so many changes, they may kill as soon as they please. My succession is provided for, my crown passes to my nephew. So I, am, I have nothing to fear. There's nothing the gods can do, but note that how she regards the gods as bitter, vindictive, and nasty, right from the outset. And you can't hurt me anymore. Being for all these reasons free from fear. Does it strike you that she's free from fear by what she said at the beginning, by the way? Just as, a, as the reader, when you read her explanation of her state of mind, does she strike you as free from fear? No, but it is to her, and already there's a discrepant awareness between the reader and the, uh, the narrative voice. And this is important as well, and it's part of the technique of Lewis, the author, is, and it's a big advance on what we find in the Chronicles of Narnia, where we more or less, uh, when the narrator tells the account, we, he is omniscient and reliable, we trust his judgment on it. Here, the narrator uh, is not omniscient and is unreliable. Right from the outset, we have reason to suspect that her account needs to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. Yes. In that way, it reminds me a bit of the priest. Like the, the yes. Like, yes. There's stuff going on in the narrative that the reader sees as being unjust. Correct. Well, certainly with Oedipus, for example, which we do in first year, Oedipus Rex, the uh, Oedipus thinks his motives are clear, and to some degree they are. He, he actually has no idea what he's done. But we, the audience watching Oedipus, already know the story of Oedipus, first of all, and know that he is guilty of all the things that he is going to uh, try and get to the bottom of. But that discrepant awareness leads to a tension uh, and a consideration of uh, whether people's account of things, their story is actually a reliable account or whether we need to think about it further. Lewis really makes uh, us aware of the same sort of things. So it's a discrepant awareness. And the audience is called upon to do something that normally uh, we don't do, which is to think at odds from the narrator. And that's a mature thing. Children don't tend to read that way. They're, they trust what they're reading to some degree. Or if they don't, they don't know how to handle that difference of posture. So this is a mature novel by Lewis written from the perspective of a, of a mature 
writer and calling upon the audience to render judgment in a mature fashion as well. So don't trust or Orwell's account of this per se. Although you have to listen to what she says, you ought to be aware that she's not entirely reliable. The fact that she thinks that there's, uh, she's not fearful of the gods is the first tell. She's a plainly an old woman who is frail and angry and bitter. And her whole life is motivated by fear. Fear of what? That's not clear at this point, but she is. But she says, being for all these reasons free from fear, I will write in this book what no one who is happiness would dare to write. I will accuse the gods, especially the god who lives on the gray mountain. So the son of Anget, that god. That is, I will tell all he has done to me from the very beginning as if I were making my complaint of him before a judge. As I say, like a barrister. I'm going to argue my own case. But there is no judge between gods and men. And the god of the mountain will not answer me. Terrors and plagues are not an answer. I write in Greek as my old master taught it to me. It may someday happen that a traveler from the Greek lands will again lodge in this palace and read the book. Then, then he will talk of it among the Greeks where there is great freedom of speech, even about the gods themselves. Perhaps their wise men will know whether my complaint is right or whether the god could have defended himself if he had made an answer. Okay, so now he or she's portraying something else that's very helpful to the story, which is a certain pre presentation of the Greeks. And the Greeks are seen as the philosophers, as rational, and as capable of doubting the myths that have been passed on to them. Now, this is the account of Western philosophy. The critique of Homer and the, um, the Paideia of the Greek epic poets. They give an account of the gods. Uh, Plato believes, just like Socrates and all of the philosophers, that their account is not reliable, that they don't know the ultimate nature of reality, they don't understand the gods at all, and they don't understand fundamental things like justice. That's what the Republic is written on, right? But not just that, any number of issues. The, the poets at present are regarded as the teachers of all Hellas, and the philosophers say you don't deserve that position because you don't understand anything about anything. You who purport to be wise, you sophists, you have no idea what true wisdom is. And true wisdom is connected with logic and certain transcendental ideas like justice that we all have intuitively. And Lewis himself believes that. That's the perspective she presents of the Greeks, which is the standard Western philosophical tradition and its account of things. But there's another strand to the Western tradition, which is not the Greek, and it is the Hebraic. And the Hebraic has a different story about the wisdom of the Greeks, right? And the cross is at the epicenter of the conflict with the Greeks in the way that it disputes that they understand what wisdom is, because for the Greeks, the cross is foolishness. And I've already talked about that different way in which the cross is central to Lewis's, uh, theologically speaking, central to his whole metier of works. I think it's absolutely crucial, and it's crucial here as well, because at the cross it's a bloody event in which the love of God is portrayed. And that love can be misunderstood from the vantage point of the Greeks, and in fact it is misunderstood from the vantage point of the Greeks here. Orwell thinks that this is the God of love who gave himself for us at the cross, this is just bloody sacrifice. Just one more bloody sacrifice. Senseless. And unjust. That's what, they, that's what the world perceives at the cross. A man who did nothing wrong was punished. That's unjust. How can the gods allow this? The gods must be unjust. So he's exploring through, through this pagan story account the issues that are central to Christian theology. So, 
And her hope here is that the Greeks will do this and they will debunk the religion of Unge, the bloody god of love. So she begins, I was Orwal, the eldest daughter of Trom, king of Glom. The city of Glom stands on the left hand of the river Shenet to a traveler who's coming up from the southeast, not more than a day's journey from Ringal, which is the last town south where there belongs the land of Glom. The city is built about as far back from the river as a woman can walk in the third of an hour, for the Shenet overflows her banks in the spring. So the city is built back a bit because sometimes the water of the river comes up and they don't want the city to be flooded. So it's just a little bit set back. And the account, and I'm not gonna read this at any great distance, uh, to any great length, but I wanna read just the beginning because she really does set the stage here. It's not just setting, but also the setting for the conflict is that beyond the house of Unget, going all the time east and north, you come quickly to the foothills of the Grey Mountain. The God of the Grey Mountain who hates me is the son of Unget. He does not, however, live in the house of Unget, but Unget sits there alone. So, and Unget is in Glom. And it's a bloody, dark, pagan temple. It's, it's, and, and this is part of its uh, repugnance to the Greeks because the Greeks are marked by light and clarity and logic. Perspicacity, intentions are clear, motives are clear. And here we, con we confront a bloody, senseless demand for blood just like we see in the Hebrew temple where sacrifices are made over and over to uh, atone for sin. In the furthest recess of her house, Anget, where she sits, it is so dark that you cannot see her well. But in summer, enough light may come down from the smoke holes in the roof to show her a little. She is a black stone without head or hands or face and a very strong goddess. Why a black stone? Is he thinking of the, in Islam, they have the black stone rep representing that? I don't know. But it's a black stone that's actually there that you can see. My old master whom we called the fox said she was the same whom the Greeks call Aphrodite. But I write all the names of people and places in our own language. So that's what the fox says but that's not what she thinks. She thinks there's a different identity here and she's correct. And in this, I think Lewis is uh, exploring the connection between Aphrodite, who's the Greek version of this and the Hellenized version of it and the light version of it, the sanitized version of it, the beautiful version of it, the version the Greek philosophers can talk about in terms of beauty and aesthetics. And we can think of all the Greek beauties and even the portraits of Venus, uh, not just here in Botticelli, but the famous v Venus de Milo, the, the statues and so forth that we see. So an idealized form of feminine beauty. But there are other goddesses correspondent to Venus that, we are, that are found in the ancient world and they have much less light and beautiful and sanitized images than Aphrodite does. And to some degree, even the uh, the Greek and Roman stories are revealing that they are connected with bloodletting and chaos and war. That's all, that's sort of in the background, but it's there. Venus leads to blood being shed for her, always. Now that's a more prominent part in the, um, as I say, the Near Eastern religious uh, point of view. And um, as I say, we can connect it. I, I, I was thinking about going this in great length, but I'm not gonna do this because it will distract too much. But you can see that this god is, uh, Venus is connected with <coughs> Ishtar as well and Astarte. And those are also mentioned in Babylonian myths and they're always connected with the uh, Canaanite and Babylonian uh, sacrifices to the gods and these are bloody and these are demonic in a way that we don't see with Venus. We don't associate that in the same way. And But Lewis wants to connect with that here and with the idea of blood above all things and connect the, the blood with 
something unexpected and, and something that appears to be irrational, but actually may be, in fact, the demonstration of true love. That, so he's exploring the centrality of the, of the cross in Christian religion by presenting the, the remyth, the myth of Aphrodite retold uh, in this. Let me go on. I will begin my writing with the day my mother died. Also a telling entry point into the story. And they cut off my hair as the custom is. The fox, but he was not with us then, said it was a, is a custom we learned from the Greeks. Bata the nurse shore me and my sister Redival outside the palace at the foot of the garden which le runs steeply up the hill behind. Redival was my sister, three years younger than I, and we two were still the only children. While Bada was using the shears, many other of the slave women were standing around from time to time, wailing for the queen's death and beating their breasts, but in between they were eating nuts and joking. So they're, they're undergoing a ritual of lament that's on the outside, but internally, like this is just what we're doing. What's the day's work? Well, we're not washing clothes the day we're lamenting. Oh, beat the breast, woe is me, whatever. And then when they get a little bit tired, we'll eat some nuts and we'll laugh around. Oh, then let's go back to the wailing again. So it's a ritualistic external observance of uh, appeasement to uh, the gods and to the right. So it's a, it's a portrait here she sees as a young woman of uh, the women who she sees as hypocrites. Very clear sighted and quite frankly, faithful to the way adolescents see adults anyway. They see them as a bunch of hypocrites because they are. Adults are hypocrites. Uh, you get to the point of maturity in your life when you realize, suddenly realize that you're a hypocrite as well. It takes a while sometimes. That's one day you realize uh, for whatever reason, uh, probably God's grace, that actually the other people that you've been accusing are no different than you are and you see their sins like scarlet. So what does that say about you? But she is not that. She is a young woman and she sees hypocrisy in the uh, adults, which is real, it's legitimate. It's just she, she doesn't see herself that way. She thinks she's clear in her intentions and motives and actions. And all the sheer snipped and red of all curls fell off. The slave said, oh, what a pity, all the gold gone. Redival was pretty in the comment. They had not said anything like that while I was being shorn. But what I remember best is the coolness of my head and the hot sun in the back of my neck when we were building mud houses, Redival and I, that summer afternoon. So we get right away the uh, awareness of Orwell that she is not a beautiful young woman. On, on the contrary, she's not attractive at all. We don't know what she looks like, but she's aware by the way others respond to her that she is not appealing. And that, uh, at, from the perspective of the reader, allows us to think differently about her. It bothers her. She brings it up in the story. It's not an incidental detail. It's an important detail to her that she's not beautiful. It will be particularly so when he meet her, we meet her sister who is the exact opposite. She is the ideal feminine beauty, not yet entered into the picture here, but she will, uh, namely Psyche. Gosh, you know, I've done this whole thing. Can you even hear me? 